All right, so uh, I'd like to open our Monday, January 22nd planning board meeting, uh, the joint meeting with the select board. Uh, on our side, uh, I'll call a roll for Sarah. Present. Seth Meehan. Here. Teresa. Here. Paul. Here. Myself. I'm here. And Associate Doug. Here. All right, great. Um, you guys want to open your side? I'll open the uh, select board meeting. Uh, and uh, Eileen, are you here? Here. Excellent. Gus, are you here? Not yet. Okay. Pete's here. Two thirds right. are here. Great. If, um, like uh, like Maria said a little bit earlier, we're going to hold public comment to the end. We'll have brief public comment. There'll be plenty of time during the uh, next few uh, meeting processes to do that, but we wanted to be able to offer up uh, some early comment from uh, citizens at the end of, of the meeting here. So uh, with that, um, if you have any questions or comments uh, that you put into the chat, please provide your address and names for the uh, meeting minutes at the end. Uh, and uh, for everyone listening to my raspy voice, I'm coming off of a cold, and and hopefully I can make it through the meeting. So uh, we'll go from here. Uh, we have our, um, you know, our consultant Emily Innes uh, that's going to kick this off uh, for us tonight. Uh, if you want to take the floor, go right ahead. Actually, Gus is here. I want to know if they want to open up the meeting. We've opened our meeting already. Okay. And um. Oh, we'll, that's right. We yeah, need, we have. A you need to just note have Gus note that right. he's in the conference for the record. Gus just needs to introduce himself that he's. Let me, let me so note that Gus Murphy has joined the meeting as a member of the select board. All right, excellent. And I think we have a couple members on our side that uh, may want to recuse themselves. Go, go ahead. I'll recuse myself. And Teresa James will be recusing herself. All right, so they're just going to drop down into the other category of the Zoom meeting, and we'll get called back up later once we get through um, uh, some of the issues. So here, here we go. Maria, do you want to kick off? Do you want me to kick off? Um, I'll defer to you. You did you did the brunt of the work, so. <laughs> okay, great. First of all, a uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, for the record, my name is Emily Ennis of Ennis Associates, and I am one of the two members of the consultant team that has been working with the town of Medfield um, on helping you with your uh, compliance with 3A. So there have been a couple of things that uh, uh, have gone on, I think, since we last saw each other. We mapped the results of the public meeting. Um, that we had a few months ago. Um, so we have a map of all of the 3A locations. I think Maria has already shared it with you on a Google Drive. I do have it with me and I can go through it. And these were all locations that were proposed as part of that public feedback. There is absolutely nothing set in stone at this point. That's part of our discussion today of which areas you would like to test. We did run some preliminary tests to see what they look like. Happy to, to share what that uh, uh, those results are. But these these are all up for discussion and I'll put them up in a moment. I also wanted to confirm that we did as a team test the um, uh, state hospital area. This has been up for discussion because there is already a planned project for it. It is a single parcel, which means it has to be tested as a single parcel, even though there are sub districts in it. It is also for the moment publicly owned land because it has not been transferred into private ownership. Um, I know Maria submitted a, a memo to the board, and so just to reiterate that although the parcel does meet the land area requirements and the core district that was tested under the existing zoning uh, more than meets your requirements under um, uh, um, under the MBTA Communities Act, but uh, you don't have the minimum required density that you would need. So um, it does not come up to the 15 dwelling units per acre. So it is not 
by itself as it stands a solution to this. So one of the reasons for the public meeting was to say, are there other districts that could be tested and what the, those districts look like? And with the chair's uh, permission, um, I'm happy to share my screen and just show you what um, uh, what we tested. And then I will pull up uh, because it's not quite up there yet. Actually, if you give me one moment, I'm just going to pull up um, the other map. And then uh, I pulled up the, the second map first instead of the first map first. So I'm just going to pull that up right now. And here it is. And now I will share my screen. Oh, I need to be enabled. Um, can you try now? Yep. Aha, there we are. Make sure this is the right one. You should see a bunch of gray districts. Um, there we go. And some pink districts and blue districts. This is what you're seeing with the cursor. Um, so all of these districts that are that you see now in the gray are the areas of discussion that came from the community input discussion on um, December 14th. Um, this is the state hospital up here, just to orient everybody. This is the town center area. Um, the reason there's some areas in pink here is because um, we went back and forth. I think some of them were shaded from the initial discussion with the um, uh, uh, the, the first meeting that we had with various, ele various elected officials and that they came up. So there have been some iterations here. I think uh, the members of the planning board also had an iteration that was on here. But all of these uh, districts were discussed during that meeting. So you can see that they range throughout the town. So it's kind of a widespread distribution. And people who were at the meeting um, uh, you know, gave various thoughts about why they had chosen particular areas. Um, for tonight's discussion, we actually looked at A1, A2, A3, and 10, just to get an idea of what would it look like if um, the MBTA Communities um, Act were, uh, if the, the zoning changes for that act were concentrated in this area. And it was interesting because as Maria and I were talking about what could we test today just to give people an idea of what it looked like? She mentioned that between 10 and A3 along this conservation land, there's a um, informal community trail. So we thought, oh, that's interesting as a connection between the two. So we wanted to um, talk with you tonight about do these areas make sense, but also use these four uh, test scenarios as uh, a way of getting the conversation started. So again, these are not set on stone. Um, they can be changed, they can be modified. And in fact, um, we've tested it, them under the parameters of the existing zoning. Um, I've also done some tweaks just to see what, what routes to compliance there might be. So with that, I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to zoom in on just those districts. That was the map I actually had up earlier because I want to show you what that looks like in terms of um, parcels and acreages. So let me just pull that up to show you. Can I add something quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So the reason that we needed to pick a couple of districts just to run the model and, and see where we were um standing as of now and i know at our last planning board hearing and this is mostly for the people listening the planning board discussed having walkable districts something that is closer to downtown would perhaps um encourage people to walk to downtown businesses that therefore not taking up the limited parking spaces available in downtown so if we were to zone on the outskirts of town then people would have to effectively drive and park in downtown and part of the um, master plan is also creating more walkable and sustainable communities. So we thought the district made sense uh, as a starting point. And the informal trail network was brought to our attention by residents in the industrial extensive workshop district. So I am interested in exploring what options there are there, but that also uh, connects the districts together. And as Emily said, nothing here is set in stone, but just starting play and say, I know there's uh, the downtown is fairly dense. So I also believe that the um, there's already higher density than 15 units an acre. So 
happy to have a conversation later on, but that was our rationale for starting there. And Emily, you can um, take us from here. Absolutely. Uh, so hopefully, again, you can see my screen. And Maria's point is a good one. You can't start a discussion without a starting point. So we thought that would give us a starting point for tonight um, and then to see see how many changes we want to make, if any. So, so what we did was we modeled these, again, based on the parameters of the underlying zoning district. So you'll see we have an A1, which is currently zoning district B. A2 is the same. There's an A3A and an A3B because this district spans two uh, separate existing zoning districts. So for the purposes of this test, we need to split, we needed to split them so we could test the existing zoning districts. And the same thing for 10A and 10B. So um, you see all of those split there. And this is just sort of a zoom into that area to see what we look like. And as Maria said, when we think about how to zone for the MBTA um, Communities Act, we want to think about the reasons why we want to choose one district over the other. So one option is this idea of concentrating more housing in uh, a town center so it can support the businesses, um, create those walkable districts, um, create a certain vibrancy in the area because you have people there who are there sort of throughout the day, morning, during the day and then evening hours. That's one reason. There are many other reasons to think about districts and I'm hoping we can explore some of them today. So with that, I'm going to stop the share now. So um, uh, maybe here's some initial feedback. See if you want to go back and look at the first map, if you wanna spend some more time on the second map, and then we can talk about what some of the results might look like uh, initially. So, but I don't wanna to get too far ahead without stopping for questions first. Should we first address the elephant in the room? The We can talk a little bit about MSH and then maybe we can circle back about choosing the districts. Good idea. So you had mentioned the um, you know, the density wasn't um, for the Metsville, it say hospital wasn't there, but if you looked at the true core area, it was in excess of the density that, that you could get. Um, explain a little bit about the you know, the parcels or not being able to have a smaller parcel in there? Yes, that's a great question. So while we can certainly model different scenarios and we can um, uh, alter the model, uh, um, there's, there's a section in the model where you can override the parcel size and that is to allow you to override excluded land. So in a situation where there's land that's being uh, in the process of being disposed of uh, for housing, you can override that, um, or if there's any other reason, right? If there's a, an error in the GIS or something, where you're telling HLC there's there's something here that you need to look at. We're overriding just the acreage. Um, this is how that works. You can also use it as we did to uh, test what this looks like. Now it happens that. RKG did this analysis and they in fact did not use the model um, because, uh, or did not use the precise model because um, some of your zoning uh, requires that the um, uh, new development be in existing buildings and existing building footprints. And that of course is to retain the historic buildings on the state hospital site. So um, in the model itself, you can only model a single parcel. You can't um, cut parcels into different pieces. So where this is for one very large uh, parcel, it has not been subdivided um, uh, using an ANR or any other process. Uh, we have to model it for submission to HLC as that single parcel. In our tests, we can test them as sub-districts, which is how we know that the campus core district can meet the density requirements. Um, uh, in the memo that uh, Maria sent, it's the uh, 670 units over 29 acres, 23 dwelling units per acre. But we can't send that to HLC because that is part of a larger parcel. So, but in theory, I mean, I know the timing isn't working for us here, but in theory, we could um, pursue a, a process to identify, the, define that parcel, right, to subdivide that parcel. 
In theory, you could pursue a process to subdivide that parcel as long as my understanding is, as long as it was done prior to submitting for compliance. So that it is a legal parcel at that point. And I have worked with one community where we looked at doing that. So um, the zoning, unfortunately, didn't pass the first time at town meeting. We'll see what happens the second time it goes to sound meet town meeting. But that was a strategy that we discussed with HLC. And they did, in fact, before it went to town meeting, they did do an ANR um, for the subdivision of that parcel working with the landowner. So well, it's questions for the for the Medfield State Hospital. Sorry, go ahead. Um, I was going to say so well, it is too late to subdivide the parcel at this one for this town meeting when we will be proposing the article. It has to be either the entirety of the parcel or not at all at this round. We can always come back and change our MBTA district if desired after an ANR has been done. And I believe it's the entire uh, campus core district. It's 22 units on acre. So that that meets um, the density for sure. But as a whole, under zoning, the whole 80 something acres is 9.5. And under our land disposition agreement, we're looking at, I think, 7.5. So we, we try to look at it from every angle. <laughs> Yes, and to that, the campus core district didn't meet your required minimum unit capacity, so it's at 670 instead of 750, and it didn't meet the acreage 29 um, at 50. So you're still going to have to look at something outside that area. Um, now, because it comes in as a higher density, you could lower the density in other places. That would work as a potential strategy. Let me jump in here. Emily, I, have, I think I have to go back to some basic questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what is your role as our consultant? And, and, and here's where I'm coming from. What I'm hearing here is, an, it, I'm, it, I'm sure it's a technically good, so this is not a disparaging remark, but it is a comment. What I'm hearing here is an administrative calculation of what we would have to be able to submit in compliance with the MBTA Communities Act in time for the deadlines that have been imposed upon us. And the comment, the discussion we're having here is to me is a tail, the tail wagging the dog, because what we're really saying is because even though we know what we're doing with the state hospital, even though we know that it will be subdivided before we can pass papers on it, because we're not, we're not actually going to transfer the entire piece of property over to Trinity in this project. Even though we know we have absolutely no intention of ever developing or wanting to develop certain of the other sub districts in the state hospital as a result of a four-year strategic hospital strategic reuse planning effort and a townwide master plan and an LDA with Trinity. Even though we know all of those things, we're doing something here that, that as far as I can tell is simply to administratively comply with the deadline where, where if, if we were taking any of this seriously, we're, we would be turning our back on 10 years of strategic planning and what we're trying to do, and we would be putting something in up for a, a, a town meeting vote, which I actually think, if, if everything I'm saying here is on the right track, and you'll get a chance to talk to me in a minute, if all of that's true, I, I can't imagine our town passing a zoning change like this with us saying, oh, it, but it's not really what we're going to do. It's just that once all these other things get worked out, we're going to undo all this stuff because we're going to come back to you. I can't see that happening. So my question, my question is really, originally, I was thinking of you as a consultant that was going to be helping us have a strategic discussion about what made the most sense to move in the direction of complying with the MBTA Communities Act. Now, that first and foremost is not an algorithm calculation. That's actually a conversation about what the possibilities are, uh, some of which may be outside of the parameters of the model you're using because they're gonna be political decisions. 
Uh, and to put it very bluntly, there's a 334 housing unit project up in the state hospital. Uh, if the state is then saying, oh, but but you can't use any of that, or you know, it's not good enough to answer the mail, we want you to figure out another 50 acres. If you look at the 334 plus the 750 potential additional housing units, that's over a thousand housing units, and I think we have 4,400 housing units in in the town. So a law that's requiring us to completely change 20 to 25 percent of our housing unit is a law that will change this town. And right now, it feels to me like all we're in this conversation, we're having the conversation because of an administrative, because of a model calculation, not having a strategic discussion. So how should I think about Innis Associates here? <laughs> you should think of me as the um, consultant who's trying to give you the information that you need as a town to decide the strategy that is best for you. So we were asked to calculate what this would look like under what the state hospital would produce under current zoning in terms of unit capacity, density, acres. We've done that. That's a data point for you. We've also collected the information that came from the public meeting in terms of the ge geographic, area, geographic areas that were defined. Done that for you, another data point. We've tested a couple of uh, areas just to get the conversation going uh, tonight. It looks like we're starting to get that going. Um, again, another data point. But what we're trying to do is say, what is appropriate for Medfield? What meets your need? You mentioned the planning processes that you've already done. I think that's critically important. We know that 177 communities have to comply with this law. It's a law, but how they do that, what's best for that community is up to that community. And so my job is to assist you in making those decisions. I'm not sure I totally got the answer to my question. Oh, it, it, first off, the first part of your answer says, we are the keeper of the official scorecard. So we'll we'll show you by the way that the rules of the game are played, here's what your scorecard looks like, Medfield. That's that's helpful information. All the rest of it, uh, what I'm really, I guess, asking, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I'm more like trying to understand what we really should expect is to get a better understanding of this, what I can think is a strategic deliberation around what we need to do and how we're going to approach this requirement, which you are correct as a law, although the, the implementation was not the legislature, it was a department, but they were empowered to do that. Uh, we have to figure out how to both politically and quantitatively respond to that. Uh, and, that to me, is that, that may not be a strategic, because of the political dimensions, that may not be a, a role that you can play there, which is okay. I was, I was kind of not precise enough in my own thinking around the scoring, uh, the pro public feedback and the brainstorming for ideas and the, and the portrayal of the possibilities. And then for me, the most important discussion we need to have is this strategic one. And perhaps that's just, a strategic discussion we need to have for ourselves because it, it's not almost not even fair for you to you're not in a position to weigh in on the political dynamics here i think it would be unfair of me to do so if i came to you and said okay. you must uh, choose these three you must choose these three areas this is your only solution do it now i don't think anybody would be particularly happy with that so my goal is to give you what we've heard so far if it's appropriate for me to make a comment, you know, for example, there are good reasons to put housing downtown. Great. There are good reasons to distribute housing throughout a community. We can talk about the, the planning needs, the planning components of that. But ultimately, the selection of which areas to move forward with is not my selection. I'm just giving you the data. It is it is all of your selection. I'll, I'll do my best to answer as many questions as I can, but it's not my selection. So one more question. I'm going to shut up because I, I will have probably contributed constructively to this meeting as far as I'm going to. My, my one question will be this. If we come up and say, listen, we know that we're going to transfer 29 acres of property over to Trinity for the uh, for this. And when we do that, it's going to be subdivided. Uh, and based on your calculations, the concentration was 20 some units per acre for those 29 acres, which means that we have covered the 25 contigu contiguous acres 
you know, big, big requirement. We've probably actually built in, taken some pressure off the rest of it because we've overshot the 15 units per acre. Uh, and our plan is to go to the state and basically say, do you want 334 units or not? Because if we have to do this, would you be in a position to tell us, well, if that's what you guys want to try to do, here's how I would advise you going about doing it. I would um, be able to, yeah, I'd be able to give you the numbers that um, uh, our team calculated. I'd be able to give you the, uh, yeah, because they're going to ask for those, right? Be able to give you the um, uh, the data for the other parts of town that would make up the difference mm -hmm. so that they see a total solution because it's not, mm -hmm. find it's not enough to give part of, the, part of the answer, right? You have to give all the answers. So I'd be able to work with you on that. And then um, if necessary, I'm happy to attend the meeting. I've certainly attended other HLC meetings with clients where they've uh, presented to HLC uh, their question or their proposal. And then depending on what HLC says, then I either help you write the remaining zoning for that, or if they say yes, or if they say no, then I help you write the, you know, find the next solution and write the zoning for that. Okay. And that again is let's, a bad let's, zoning. Let's, let's let that okay. But yeah. I'm good. Let, yeah. Let's let that there. Leave that there. <laughs> Can I go back and ask a question, Emily? Um, so as I understood it regarding the state hospital for the core campus, which isn't big enough to meet the size requirements, the density is in excess of 15 units per acre. So it would satisfy our requirement. We'd have to have a second district that got us to the balance to 50 it would meet the contiguity requirement because it's over 25, but we'd have to get to 50. And then that we could have on average less than 15 per acre because we need to have 15 total. But there are two <clears throat> logistical problems with the state hospital. One is the fact that it's not a separate parcel. The, the part that's 22 units per acre is not a separate parcel and it needs to become such before mm -hmm. you're tested for compliance. And secondly, have we gotten a read on whether the state is okay with the land disposition agreement limitation on the amount of housing that can actually build, because wouldn't that bring it below 22 per acre? So I'm going to defer back to Maria on that because she was the last person, I think, to reach out to the mm -hmm. state. Maria, last I heard they had not said anything, but just to confirm that's still true. No, they hadn't said anything before. And now that I was waiting to hear back on whether we actually had 15 units an acre under zonings, I thought we might. And the density came so much under that I thought we would have this meeting first. And then I can reach out to the state, depending on how the board wants to follow up and any questions that you might have. And Kristen and I have been trying to reach out to the state and we've sent out um, reminder emails every month or so. And they are... Um, they're so busy. It's difficult to reach the um, the people as high up as we need to make a determination such as this. I think uh, I'm going to interrupt Maria. Maria is being very kind. Um, they are not difficult. They're not busy. They're being difficult because they don't want to answer this question for us. Um, I have 25 years in, so I can freely speak about that. Maria cannot. Um, I will share an email with all of you later this evening. The attorney general has weighed in on the case um, with Nick Milano regarding Milton's actions on this. Um, this is no longer about grant eligibility. Um, this is about legal enforcement by the attorney general for not coming into compliance. And for those of you not familiar with the Milton case, Milton Town Meeting actually approved the zoning districts. But Milton has a peculiar bylaw where you can then if you're unhappy with town meeting action, take something to the ballot. And that's where that is headed. And the attorney general has sent them a notice um, saying that they need to retain all of their records for future enforcement of this. So this, they're not busy. They don't know how to deal with Medfield because we started this hospital project before this law was passed. And they were afraid by allowing us to count that LDA and the pre, what I'm calling the pre a &R subdivision of this lot, that they are um, making other cases for other towns more difficult for themselves. So they are ignoring us completely on this, to be honest. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think we had an answer. And obviously it's unfortunate because even if we decided to have density in excess of 15 units per acre somewhere else, it, 
we're we're trying to figure out whether we need to get to 50 acres of that or uh whatever the difference is between 50 and however many acres the state hospital is. Um, so it, it really moves the needle in a, in a substantial way. But what I was going to suggest without answers to those questions is that we focus on the other areas in town for this meeting and, and how we would reach a compliance strategy without the benefit of the state hospital in the event that we can't get the positive determination that we need from the state that the existence of the LDA doesn't negate compliance and or we can't separate it in the way that it would need to be in time. So that's my sort of suggestion as a framework for how to move forward is just continue to pursue the state hospital, um, but to come up with an alternative strategy that complies without it. So Sarah, I want to make one reaction to that. It, I understand the logic for doing that because it's a, it's an issue of sizing up um, sizing up with the, the legal fight we would have if we didn't do it and, and Christine's finding more from Milton. I look at this actually as realizing this is not a housing issue. This is not a housing law. This is actually the state letting local governments know we can take your power away anytime we want, frivolously, not frivolously. We can we can just do that. Uh, and we will prove that to you in court. If you you do the things we've asked you to do, and in fact, you overachieve on the things you, we've, you've asked us to do, uh, but we're going to ask you to do something else, and you're going to learn that if we tell you to do that, you have to do that. Here's my concern. If we do what you're suggesting, and I understand the logic for doing that, and from the workshop we had, I actually think we can get there. We'll, we'll have debates over specific parcels, uh, but I think we can get there based, I walked out of that workshop saying, well, if, if we never had a state hospital, we had to do it. I think I know what it would look like. And I think that's what you're suggesting we do. My concern is when that option is on the table, the state will say, okay, you can do it. I don't think if we do that for these 50 acres, that the state hospital is a wise project for this town on top of that. So the issue isn't, whether these, you know, we do this hypothetical thing and they don't, and they reject it. And then we just say, okay, here's 50 acres. Oh, and by the way, we're doing the state hospital. I think the pl as a planning board, certainly as in speaking as one select board member, the idea of introducing over a thousand housing units of a particular type into this town, I, I think that's, the mis I think that is a strategic mistake for us to do. If we have to do the 50 acres for the MSBA communities, then after 10 years of seeing something that I thought was going to be great at the state hospital, I think we need to reconsider whether that, in fact, is a good idea. And, and then we'll have a different set of legal issues, given we have a preliminary agreement there. But I don't think that they're just independent things and it doesn't matter. I think it does. So. Yeah, and my only my only counter to that, and I think this has been the position the planning board has had through this this whole process, and, and people on the board can um, agree or disagree. Uh, but one of the ways we tried to approach it in selecting the districts that we are advocating for is that the natural kind of the the nature of the parcels that we were looking at, particularly downtown, prohibit them from being developed in significant ways. And I think Emily and and Maria could go through a few examples of. It's really shocking when you go downtown and you look at the density per acre and how few units it ultimately produces because the parcels are so small. So you can get to that 15 units per acre pretty easily in the downtown with, a, you know, like Jane's Ave, that's substantially over 15 units per acre. That what we did in the planning board in trying to look at the parcels we were suggesting, we said the natural topography of the land limitations of the streets around it, the infrastructure, make it such that we're not going to actually get a thousand units of housing. There are a couple of parcels that could result in a larger number of units. And I think Emily and, and uh, Maria could maybe even go through like the Papaginos Plaza, you know, the Shaw's Plaza, if that came in. But if you look at the, the core of downtown, the height limitation and the infrastructure and parking is going to make it such that those aren't really developable in that way. And as I understand the zoning, it's not will these projects or these parcels ultimately be developed? It's could they in theory be developed? And the reality is, I don't think they will. 
Okay. Okay. I will, I will revise my comments. If that's where we're, if that's what this is, which is a, uh, <laughs> if, if that's what we're trying to do, what you just described is basically comply with a law that we, we, we expect, I won't say we know, we expect won't have much of an impact on the town. I will change my headset and I get it and let the games begin. Well, I can't, I mean, I can't, none of us can say for sure that someone won't go quietly around and acquire 20 parcels in the RU and assemble them all into something that could become, you know, a larger development. Um, but it, it happens over time. It requires the buy-in of a lot of different people. It's not like a, this thing gets adopted and poof, the next day we're dealing with hundreds of units of housing. I think one of the things that was helpful for me when the planning board at the last session, when a few of us were in the same subgroup, we looked at like, what is the density of the Metacomet apartments? And that was over 15, um, but that's a huge parcel of land. Um, so I think that I was surprised at the last public information session that people who came, which is not necessarily representative of everyone in town, but the people who came were like, I kind of want more housing in all of these kind of remote locations. The planning board had viewed it more of a, how do we comply with the zoning ordinance without necessarily resulting in all of this housing being created? So I don't know, are there others on the board wanna, Seth or Jim or Doug, you wanna give any feedback? No, I think you said it well, Sarah, I, you know, cause I, I got the two parallel tracks that we were on going into the last meeting, state hospital on one track and then option B. And that's, that's I think, let's the let games begin. If, if Emily's kind of looked at the existing parcels for A1, A2, A3 and 10, and then see what it would look like with compliance, I'm really curious on what that area looks like downtown in terms of the, the density as it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I take the point about state hospital, but I think, you know, we've got to get something voted on pretty soon. So let's, let's have a conversation that moves along. Yeah, I'll add that, you know, I, you know, consistent with what's already been said on the planning board side, once in my head was first at the big parcels, right? Like the Shaw's Plaza and things like that. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and says, if, if, if one landowner can, you know, turn over one parcel and get the density of that nature and have a mega complex, um, we should be going for the smaller parcels. And by the way, they should be downtown anyway. Right, so somebody to assemble three or four or five or six parcels to get that larger scale density. When you looked at the residence, residency, um, you know, that program that was uh, brought up and within the meeting that showed, okay, here's a, uh, a, a, one, a one acre parcel and here's the density that's on it. Once you put those other constraints, like Sarah said, parking, you know, uh, uh, building heights, things like that, it's gonna be very hard to realize too many of those larger, larger kind of developments, um, particularly if we use the downtown smaller parcels. The other thing I think that's worth noting in terms of what the planning board was looking at when we suggested to a to whatever the letters that Emily went through were, was we looked at parcels that had been recently developed with the thought that it's not likely that someone will kind of scrap that investment and start over and, and build something. So we tried to pick places that were either we thought appropriate for redevelopment. Like I think there was a discussion about off of Brook Street, the um, housing there is maybe ripe, ripe for redevelopment. But other than that, we picked places where we thought someone was not likely to redevelop anytime soon. Um, and therefore it would dissuade, you know, the result of actually having any more units created. Do we know when we look at the downtown parcels, is there, a real estate group that has some significant parcels already that would potentially, when I say this, hopefully it's not taken the wrong way, but but then potentially put us at risk for changing the feel and, and look of our downtown right now? As far as I know, and I can check tomorrow and send you a follow-up email. The only one I'm aware of is the person who owns Starbucks, owns brothers and he may own one more but that's about it um but i can do a little js analysis and see if there are any repeat owners and um i can run the um one a one a two and a three zones 
I mean, it's something that we should look at, not go into it with our eyes closed. That if, if like I look at it, if I'm in downtown right now and I look to where Royal Pizza is in that whole strip, if by chance one person owned a large portion of that real estate that went down towards like Larkin's Liquors and they saw what was playing out here and they realized they could cash in, that would completely change the dynamic of what our downtown looks like. I think the other parcel that um, we should talk about with regard to having potential for a large development is the Montrose School parcel. We yeah. specifically excluded it from the um, the district because it doesn't help your did not your calculation anyways because it's excluded land. Um, but that was very intentionally excluded, uh, not only because it didn't help the calculation, but also because if it ever cease to be a school, it would be a very large parcel that could have a lot of housing put on it. So we didn't want to convey the benefit of that up zoning to that parcel in case it ever ceased to become a school. Um, but Maria, if you, I think that would be helpful to Eileen's point. I think the good thing about the Salvatore Capital parcels is they're not contiguous. So, you know, each one, if they did all of them, it, it could be sizable, but I think height is going to be their problem on all of those parcels in terms of getting anything particularly dense. Yeah, and then I think, go ahead. On this, I was gonna say, I think Mrs. Larkin also owns um, three or four buildings, but those are actually, I think businesses or thriving businesses. So I don't foresee them turning over, but I will have that map to you by the end of the week and we can continue that conversation. Yeah, question I have too, to your, to your point, Eileen, is like, how do we set up a structure where you know the downtown might change but it changes for the better mm -hmm. right it's there's some issues and and there's a lot of infill opportunity to make it more vibrant and so how do we take advantage of this to create a structure where if it changes which change is inevitable it's going to be for the better and 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 for me it's not about 30 units on two acres it's about five units on a third of an acre like how do we create more sensitive infill opportunities to densify downtown without creating these like mega complexes. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I think there's opportunity to do that. Um, I just don't know from a numbers perspective, if we think about it in that fine grain, does it all add up to what we need to hit, right? Cause I think for, for our downtown, it would be better to have these smaller developments. Um, but does it add up? I, that's, a, that's a question. Like, how do we think about it? Maybe it's not a one or the other, um, but I'm certainly more in favor of these smaller infill housing with a little bit of retail than the the mega thing out on the on the edge, right? Um, if we can set up a structure that facilitates that. So if I'm looking at the map, and I'm just thinking out loud, because if I was a resident and I was getting ready to go to a town meeting and I saw a map like this, and let's just say we go with the pink and we and I'm looking at Ferry Street, and I know there's an apartment complex on Ferry Street. Does this new MBTA law enable someone that, let's just say, owns an apartment complex to look at it as a potential money grab that says, oh, you know, I've got an apartment complex today that houses X. Because of this law, by right, I can do some things that let me do a bigger, bolder footprint um, that would impact that neighborhood if they went bigger and larger. Um, is that something that this MBTA community thing wouldn't would allow? So not necessarily. Um, uh, and the reason I say not necessarily is, first of all, depends on what we zone it for, right? So uh, that, depending on how we do the zoning. We might be zoning for where it is now, that particular, that our imaginary apartment complex. We might but be zoning. There's an apartment complex there today. So in a neighborhood. Right, right. But what, it, what I meant is in, in this thought construct, right? We might be zoning for what that apartment complex actually is, in which case there's no incentive to change. We might be zoning it for a little bit more than what's there today, but it's not enough of an, a financial incentive for them to take down an existing building that's making money. What you might think about is, are there properties that you want to see changed and what the incentive would be for that? So I always say, if you've got a two and a half story building now and you change the building height to three stories, it's probably, it's not enough to make it worthwhile. 
Um, so, you know, just that one tiny little change. So we can go in um, and look sp at specific parcels and see what they are now and then see what would the impact of changing the zoning have on those particular parcels. So just as an interesting note, I pulled up the Frary Street apartments. I'm thinking of the ones down behind the back of, it's like a big brick apartment complex behind a few houses in the front. So um, according to Residency, that eight now is 12.55 units per acre. So you just have to get to 15. Mm -hmm. To Emily's point, that upzoning of you know three units per acre isn't going to feel that different. First of all, a developer, whoever you know has control of that, may not think that that's enough of a return on investment to bother to do anything outside their ordinary course of redevelopment. But if that's a project that should be redeveloped because it's outdated, when they go and do it, you know, I expect maybe they would take advantage of that density. But that three units more per acre on that size parcel with the height limitations and parking requirements that would go with it, as well as lot coverage, I don't think is going to feel more impactful to the neighborhood in a meaningful way. But if you take the approach that we were just talking about a few minutes ago, where someone starts to buy up land, so let's just say like the two homes that are in the front, right? And then uh, and then even the property to the right of it, now you've changed the dynamics of that land because now you could build, put a lot more, yes? In theory. Yeah, I mean, if you like, if you ac ac acquired kind of that parcel in the back and then the 10 houses that surround it, yeah, it could. But at the same time, you know, there's, and maybe the Frary Street apartment isn't a good example, but there are some places in town where having a larger apartment building complex is maybe not a bad thing. Like Aura, I think is a successful project. It's in a location where, you know, we need housing. Mm -hmm. It's not super impactful. There's not a lot of abutters. So there's strategic locations where, to I think Doug's prior point, densifying is not a bad thing. Don't disagree with Particularly that. Right? Where you can walk into town and, and not create more vehicle and parking impacts. Hey, Doug, just I wanted to follow up with a quick question on the comment you made. And maybe maybe you had this in mind. I, I appreciated what you were saying around what would be nice to have is higher density, you know, almost micro lot type stuff. I get I get that. But the but the minimum zoning size is five acres so even though that would be a great thing that we'd like to see it's going to be done in the context of a minimum of a five acre zone and it's the economics of development in that five acre zone that's going to determine whether you're going to luck out or not with just a little one third five unit you know five units per third acre or something like that uh, that, so that yeah, part that's the question is what's the what's the scale of the contiguous site and is there enough developable lots in downtown to piece it together to hit the minimum? I, I don't know the answer. Maybe Emily does. So I can tell you that um, the A1, A2, and then the two A3 districts together are A3A and A3B. Got to love all the, the numbers and names. That comes up to 90.6 acres. So you're more than meeting your 50 acres there. Um, the unit capacity right now under current, just taking the dimensional standards of the current zoning and just assuming multifamily as of right, um, would be 898 units. So you're over your 750. So we can think about reducing acreage. You are low on your dwelling units per acre, you're at 10.4 for those districts. So it's not getting you to the 15. But as I look at the districts, um, uh, because we can go in, there's there's uh, summaries of the characteristics of the districts in there. For example, district, district four on my compliance model, which is A3B, um, it has a total number of parcels of 51, 46 of them are non-conforming. So they're not contributing to the unit calculations or to the density. And so the first thing I would be doing is saying, well, what happens if I reduce the parcel size on those so more of those become conforming? What does that do? So this gets into the, I can tell you what you have now. 
I can get direction from you as to what to test. And then we can test various scenarios. What happens if we increase the height? What happens if we increase the lot coverage? Uh, what happens if we increase the FAR or take the FAR off because it's residential? However you want to do this, um, we can use the model to iterate and come up with, okay, these are what the numbers look like. Does this make sense on the ground? And that would be the next conversation. And I've done some of that iteration already. So I can tell you that it is, in fact, possible get, to get to 15 dwelling units per acre in this area. Your number of units goes up, but that's because I changed lots of different things all at once. So okay. just to test it, I would go back and be more strategic if we were formally examining each of these districts or any of the other districts that were brought up during the um, public meeting. So if I if I can, I'll throw one more. I, I'm arguing against myself here, Emily. So I, I think I'm helping you out here. The the we we've been and I used it as well. 50, 50 acres times fifteen seven hundred fifty units. The discussions we're having here in terms of the incremental impact on the town. If we have mm -hmm. a zone which is already effectively a ten unit per acre zone, then suddenly a fifteen unit per acre zone is not seven hundred fifty units added. It's actually a third of that. Uh, and so I'm trying to work with this direction of can you make this work by not fighting the problem with the hospital? I, I will point out that it actually is important if we're targeting zones that already are zoned for multi-unit housing, uh, multiple housing units, then this is an incremental increase in that zone, potentially could be an incremental increase. Suddenly, the magnitude of the impact is a lot, potentially a lot smaller if we're thoughtful about how to do that. So I, I, I am on board with that as well. And I think that gets at why we were focusing downtown. I know people uh, circled levels at our meeting and we're talking about an incremental impact that would be vastly greater as opposed to what you'd be doing at an already dense area. Um, so that that's the thought process behind why we had so much pink uh, in the center of town. Um, and the numbers are great. How did you get there, Emily? You said you came close to getting to being compliant. Um, is that with just A1, 2, and 3? That's with A1 and 2 and 3. And I also um, uh, did some iterations on 10 as well to see what would happen there. Let me just give you the, I've got four models open. So I have to remember to open the right one before I give you the numbers. Um, let me just tell you what I did on 10. Let's see. Um, that is the other one. Ah, here we go. Um, so 10, which was into uh, two separate districts. Um, hang on, it's just gone. This is trouble when you've got four models open simultaneously. So 10 was kind of interesting. That was, um, that's 19 acres. It's 139 unit capacity. Um, and then it came up to, it was quite low. It came up, but actually not too bad. It was nine dwelling units per acre. So you'd have to do a little bit more work to get there. Um, and so what I did, we've got something called the zoning input summary, and that's a summary of all of the parameters that go into the model. So you can see lot size, you can see open space, um, maximum lot coverage, building height, floor area ratio, and parking. Those are among the key ones that go in. So I just started playing around with those. So the first thing I did was increase the building height to three. Um, uh, because one, the RS district is at two, the uh, BI district is at 2.5. So what happens if you just tweak it up that way? The BI district has a maximum lot coverage of 20%, which is low if you're trying to do that. So at first I increased it to, I think, 75, um, which gets it closer to that 90, which is a little bit more, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the, uh, the, the, the flipped model. At any rate, um, I increased them both. I increased the that district to the B the RS district. Sorry, from um, a maximum lot coverage of twenty to a maximum lot coverage of fifty, and I increased the FAR to from 0.35 to 0.5. So again, not a huge increase, not uh, um, the more downtown level of uh, ninety percent. That's the BI uh, for the industrial. Um, uh, and saw what that did. And actually that got a, that got a lot closer. Let me pull that up. So with the, here we go. 
with the um, zoning districts matched at a minimum lot size of 10,000, open space at 20, although there's room to adjust that because I have the maximum lot coverage at 50, increase the parking spaces per dwelling unit to two because that would give me the maximum impact. Um, in, uh, change the floor area ratio to 50. So all of the 10 districts did that. That got us to a dwelling units per acre of 22.3, minimum multifamily unit capacity of 344, and the land area obviously 19. So, so that was changing a lot of different parameters. Again, we could go back and change parameter by parameter to see where we are. But you see that um, uh, that wasn't... Um, there wasn't necessarily a huge change in the A districts. I dropped one of them down to a 5,000 square foot minimum lot size, and that captured most of the non-conforming lots. Couldn't understand why I went down to 10,000 and it didn't um, change the model much. And it's because most of the lots in that area were under 10,000 square feet. So that made a big change right there. Um, same thing. I played around with the FAR. I played, played around with the lot coverage a little bit. Um, and got got it much, much closer. So so these are the things that we can um, say, okay, now remember these are mathematical exercises, right? And that's why I'm saying, happy to test the districts, come back and tell you what it looks like, but then we need to look at what's gonna happen on the ground. And we can do that because the model calculates it on a parcel by parcel basis. So you can say, hey, I'm concerned about the impact of this parcel. What is it like under the existing zoning? What does it look like um, under the uh, proposed parameters that we've tested? And we can come back and say, hey, that parcel would increase by three units. Um, its capacity would increase by three units or 10 units or 15 units, whatever it might be. Then we can say, does that make sense on that ground? Is that actually going to make a difference or not? Emma, can you pull up the map again? Yeah, absolutely. Which one do you want? The main one with all of the pieces or just the 10 A's, 10's and 3 and A's that we were looking at? I think the zoomed in one is better. Yep, absolutely. This. Yeah. Uh, this should be it right here. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. My only thought here, and I know it's something that we've discussed at previous planning board meetings, is 10B is on the BI district, and mm -hmm. I would rather stay away from the industrial zone itself simply because we don't have many commercial zones. I think it makes sense in the downtown because we can incentivize shops on the bottom floor if if that's the direction we wanted to go. Um, but I would rather leave the industri industrial district um, out myself I know I that's with you, Maria um I I I wasn't wild about 10a either but I'm coming around to it um because aura is there and I think that also includes the Goddard school and the apartment building next to it and that was per parcels that we I think I just looked on residency and I think that um what's it called um aura is like 12 units per acre yeah. right now um, so the likelihood that Aura would get redeveloped to get to 15 seemed pretty low. So for me, 10A felt like a safe place. Oh, and on the Goddard Street side, the physical topography of the land makes the development of that apartment building for more units seem unlikely to me. That's pretty well maxed out at its height and its lot coverage with the topography. So if that's 13.6 acres towards our 50, that is unlikely to be redeveloped. I thought that made sense. And if the vet on the corner did get redeveloped, I think it would be a good place for an apartment building because it would be right next to Aura. So I, I was in favor of 10A, but not 10B. 10B is the park, right? Or the fundamentally park? It's actually, isn't it like Paul's? It's <laughs> Will's. Wills and the uh, landscape. Oh, 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 uh, it's the the everything from the the stoplight up to the park, like the the commercial businesses between the corner and leading down the so street. The park, the park is to the left of 
I live here and I'm trying to visualize right yeah, now. It's, it's to the left and in the back a little bit more. Yeah. The back a little. And and that is not included in the 10B that we have there. The Correct. park is eight. Well, hold on. I take that back. The park is 12 units per acre. And then part of it's 8.96. I'm not sure why it has two different. Right. I think we didn't include the park because to get there, you've got to go through a large chunk of the exempted land. Yeah, right. just the left of uh, yeah, just the west the of that. Yeah. So. Well, the park, it's the, I don't know what you mean by that, Seth. You can get to the park off of West Street. No, right. that needs to be, the district needs to be contiguous. Right. They're talking about how to draw the boundary versus how you physically access it. Actually, so. Emily, it looks like the park's two parcels are together more than five acres. So could you include just those parcels as a, a, a 10 C? Yep, we could certainly test it, absolutely. So is this the park public land or no? No, this is the 40B, the park, not, oh, not park, oh, P-A-R-T. Yeah. No, no, yeah, Drive about, about, apartments. Yeah, the logic, the logic for aura and all that being included to me holds for the park. No, I think I think that's fair. I think we yeah. didn't think it was because it wasn't contiguous. But if the the smallest district has to be a minimum of five acres, I think the park exceeds that. It's close to eight. Can you see my mouse? Is it these two parcels here? Yeah, or is it um, those two parcels there. It's okay. if you go on residency, right. it's three hundred Gatehouse Drive and one Gatehouse Drive. Okay. Together, it has uh, like 90 units on 547 and 373. Mm -hmm. So it's like nine acres. It might just be contiguous with 10A if it's if it's the ones that I'm thinking. I'll, I'll look it up, obviously, but it might just be contiguous with 10A for going across the street there. So Great. that's a possibility, too. But we could certainly model it as a 10C and see what that looks like. So if we did that, let's call it, um, let's call it eight and a half for sake of argument, um, then we're at 22 between 10A and the park. Mm -hmm. That leaves 28 for the A areas for which we've identified a, a lot more than that. Well, you, so, you'd be better off at figuring out a way to add three to 10A and 10. You still need 25. Or I guess maybe you could do that with the A district. I tell him back up. You're putting 25, making the 25 continuous acres a combination of the A districts, is what you're saying. Got it. Yeah. But we have, so A2 is 34, A3B is 33. So you could bring one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. And so what I can do is I can prepare a table that shows sort of different options of combinations and what that could look like and what that um, the overall density would be. So um, in your unit capacity and your acres, so I can give you some options of combinations for your next discussion. Um, and then we, we, we wanted to use this discussion to see where you wanted to go with what came out of the public meeting for the next discussion. Then I can give you the, the options, you know, maybe three options for discussion, and then obviously work our way to a hybrid that, um, that makes sense for you. I think that would be worth for your sake, Emily, talking quickly about whether we want you to focus on a one, a two, a three B or a three A. Um, and if we are going to go with the strategy of 10A plus the park, then um, the A1 won't help our contiguity problem. Um, and I don't know how people feel. While Metacomet Apartments is there, I do think that's a parcel that someone could theoretically redevelop, but also it's a condo. So maybe not because it would be too hard to get control of all of them. That's why we included it. And I think we thought it was the same thing with Old Village Square. Nobody's going to get control of 30 over a million dollar townhomes and redevelop that. So I don't know if you include that and that enables you to make the downtown, the A2, the A3 be just 25 instead of 28. 
-hmm. and then you're slightly over 50, you'd be at like 53. Can I add, um, isn't what is a board thing for A3B and A3A simply because they're residential? If we keep our zoning to currently residential districts, then effectively the business areas could, again, be safe and keep the tax base as is. My fear is that if it ever happened, if we don't include a provision for um, shops in the first floor or if the developer chooses not to take it, we might risk some of our downtown businesses that are so important to vibrancy and actually having a walkable destination to you know walk to. But I I don't know what it looks like exactly on the ground, but I think the A3 districts, because they have the open space nearby, also kind of encourages you know more sustainable living, uh, quality of life. It's close to downtown, it's close to green spaces, and it's out of those commercial zones. But I'm wondering, you guys who actually have more knowledge of the neighborhoods, what would that look like in reality? I know Ferry Street is apartments or there's some apartments there and it's close enough to downtown but it's not the downtown which feels appropriate yeah that's really right. I think, you know, we were looking at, you know, A3B because there was already affordable housing kind of developed on it. it it's home ownership, you know, individual properties, um, if I recall. And then um, so the likelihood of it being redeveloped was, was low, right? It's not about getting the density in the right place, but it, it falls into that, you know, redevelopment um, scenario as being low. It'd be interesting to see a model that is 10A plus the park, A3B at 25 acres, and A1. That that seems to me like the scenario that's the least likely to result in any new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just that's 10A, the park, three uh, A3B, and A1. But A3B at 25 the a minimum to be contiguous. So yeah. you'd have to decide what to carve out of it. Okay. Right. I'm guessing right now off the top of my head, you carve off whatever's um, planned south of 27. Yeah, it would be 10A plus the park, right? 10A plus the park, A1 yeah. and A3B reduced to 25. We can, and we can see what Why don't we like A3A? Well, I I mean I I don't mind A three A and I um is the part A three B has like a like the public way that goes to the is that to the DPW building that's bisecting it Emily yeah uh, let me zoom in a little bit more for you all so right in here the this oh, one here. you're too zoomed in or I can't see your cursor oh A three okay never mind. That, at, that um, triangular shape, um, is that yeah. Turtle Brook? That's Turtle Brook. The, the upper one is Turtle Brook. The lower one is the, is the home ownership uh, houses. Affordable. Yeah. So, I mean, we could also look at pulling in the apartment building on Frary in lieu of Turtle Brook if we wanted to actually have a place where we incentivized a redevelopment. But you know, it, it could end up that that gets redeveloped and the people who live in the front houses on Frary have something more significant in their backyard. I guess it, it's a question of whether or not we want to open up the opportunity for the Frary Street apartment building right. to be redone. So just a couple of reminders on this. Um, one is we're talking a little bit um, about what could happen in which districts on a micro level. So don't forget, you can have sub-districts in here. So each of these that we're testing could have a different level of uh, dimensional standards and therefore uh, different densities. So that's something to remember. The other thing to remember is you've got a number of housing needs because all communities do. And um, something like a Frary Street where you might want it to redevelop, 
that could be part of a fee. That doesn't have to be part of the MBTA Zoning Act as well. That could be something where you're addressing that under a different type of zoning change. So not all of your housing needs would be met by this or not all of your um, desire to redevelopment, redevelop certain sites might be met by this. So just something else to consider yeah. as your properties. I think that's a fair point because I know we we the planning board would like to come back and look at the rezoning of the business district for ground floor retail and apartments above. But I think that added unnecessary complications to the MBTA Zoning Act compliance when you added the commercial element in. So I think we talked about that being something we would come back and do later. Um, so to that point, I'm working with at least one other community what, where they want to preserve that ground floor use, um, uh, commercial use in their downtown or their town center. And so they're looking at adding the housing kind of around it, almost like a crescent shaped. Um, uh, so that the housing can support the town center and the commercial uses, but not necessarily supplant it. There are other ways of doing it, creating a bonus for the, the mixed use um, that is above the multifamily. That does get a little bit more complicated in discussions, but it's certainly an avenue to uh, the, just to be aware of. Or you can do as you're doing and say, you know what, we're just holding it for another time. I think I'd rather, you know, hold it for another time because I, I think we're in the place where we're looking, we're already pretty physically constrained horizontally. So I don't really see that being a, a real opportunity here. Makes perfect. So, so what I'm hearing is, is for the next steps, model 10A in the park, A3B, but reduce it down to 25 acres and A1, see what that looks like. General consensus on that. Is there anything else you want me to test um, to um, see if there are additional options? Um, and obviously, I can do those at different levels of, of uh, um, dimensional standards to give you different levels of density. So you can say, you know, maybe there's a, um, a high, a medium, a low. Maybe there's just a low and a medium. Um, but just so you can see what the different options are, or what happens if I tweak height versus what happens if I tweak FAR or building coverage, um, and then you know we can talk about what that means. But are there any other um, scenarios that you want tested? Just in keeping with the land that we identified as pink, the um, Metacomet Park and Maple Street in, mm -hmm. in place of A one. I'm just thinking about kind of the, the meetings we've had about encouraging mixed use downtown. And I take Maria's point that if we focus too much downtown. I said, can you zoom out, um, Emily? Yeah. I said A1, but I meant Metacomet. Um, I thought that label applied to them. What is the acreage of Metacomet and Old Village Square? It's identified as 12 on one of your maps, Emily. Uh, I am looking to see if I have the acreage on here. I don't have the acreage on the other map. I'm looking Old at Village the Square is about seven acres, just under seven, I think. So that would put us quite a bit. I mean, not that would be fine, but that would put us even farther over 50. Um, Metacomet is 6.35 and Old Village is 6.95. So 13 and a half. So we'd still have to have A3B at 25 for the contiguity requirement. I could throw those in as a test just so you could see what it looked like. Yeah, that's what I thought I was asking for. So I'm glad you brought that up, Seth. I was reading all <laughs> No problem. <laughs> I, I wondered because I, I heard Maria's two comments that I, which were, you know, my hands off my downtown area so we can have business there and hands off my blue district as well. Uh, and so I wonder if we can get it so that we're focusing on 12, which is Maple Street and Metacomet and then A3 um, and even getting away from 10. Okay. Or at Just least 10A as we had it. I mean, 10, 10A is already kind of developed to a point where it's not going to affect but I think 10A would be much. Yeah, 10A would. 10A plus the park. But, and those those aren't zoned for business currently. 
well, maybe the park was, but um, yeah. they're not going to become business anytime soon anyways. That's right. No one's going to tear down or to try to go dancer, right? Right. I think What's also the from the, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I think from the public meeting, uh, I think there is some group of people who would like to see things, some amount of it pushed away from the downtown. So I think including 10A is kind of a nod to not locating all of it right downtown. It looks to me like you've included in 10A a couple private single family homes, and I'm not quite sure why they're included. That might be something you'd want to consider. Let me go back and, and just summarize what my thoughts are, which is that I, I would hope that we go forward with the scene if we can subdivide the hospital to get that to comply before the end of the year. I think we have enough time to do that, maybe not for the town meeting, but I think we can do it. Um, and secondly, I've just been very interested and surprised, pleasantly surprised that you guys are coming up with so many ways of accomplishing this that don't really change the town that much at all including things like aura in the park and things that aren't likely to be changed. Um, if, if I may, Pete, the only issue with trying to subdivide the hospital now is that this bylaw, if we include it, couldn't have the state hospital in May. We will be pushing the vote for this in November. And if for any reason it fails, we would fall out of compliance for the time being until the next town meeting. So there's a, a element of risk um, because of the timing of, of the subdivision. I don't know if Emily or Christine wants to add um, more to I, that. It, so I my answer to that would be that I would have a plan B. I would, I mean, you know, there's a way to do it in these areas that we've been talking about tonight, certainly. Um, but I, I wouldn't give up on the hospital, I guess would be my suggestion. I think one of the things we need to talk about um, is if we include the state hospital and we change that zoning now to allow for that, and for whatever reason, the Trinity sale does not go forward, we have now zoned a piece of property by right. It is yeah. our property, so we can choose to whom it goes. Um, if the Trinity sale doesn't go through, then it's still it public. Right, it, it won't count. The Communities yeah. Act. Yeah, Pete, Pete I, uh, I, I'm with you that I'm, I'm really pretty steamed that we're doing what we're doing at the state hospital, and now we have sort of, in my view, a whimsical uh, direction from the state to go run into another in another direction, and beyond that. Uh, as we learned at the Mass Municipal Association annual meeting, Governor Healy has yet another affordable housing plan in place. So I don't think you should look at the MBTA communities law as the last thing that's going to happen. But in fact, if the MBTA communities law proves to be a law that's relatively easy for, for communities to comply with without actually building more housing, I can almost guarantee you there'll be some other directive coming from the state looking for for communities and i'm frustrated with that because it basically i, I think we have been try, we've tried to be thoughtful about this stuff we've tried to move in the direction in the case of the 40b affordable we were on a track to overachieve and apparently that was a mistake you should basically just try to get by with a minimum because they'll come in with some other requirement having said all that um the one thing that was said at the beginning of the meeting that is mean, first off, Christine, your points about the state looking at the state hospital. I think what I read, not even necessarily between the lines, is the state isn't going to do that. Not that, you know, they just aren't. Uh, they don't have to. And when we submit this and comply, the answer is going to be C, you can do it. Mm -hmm. However, uh, to Pete's point, if it, if in fact this transaction goes through and if in fact Trinity does get the project and moves forward with the project, we're gonna to have to subdivide it into to, to transfer the property to Trinity. And the point was made at the beginning of this meeting. And if after you've done something, 
you then do something different, you can change your high density zoning. So I'll, this is, I'm turning my argument upside down here. I'm again, arguing against myself where I started is that if that, if what Christine is saying is true, then okay, we have a rock and a hard place uh, without enough leverage necessarily to do it. But after the fact, you could always subdivide it, basically rezone that to be that higher density and then take away the zoning in some place. If there's some place that even though we think nothing in the near term is gonna happen, we perceive a long-term threat, we'll just undo that zoning and, and flip it back. So uh, I, I, I agree with your sentiment, Pete, but I'm trying to understand the pragmatic reality here and what the, you know, is the best pit, is the best step to go forward and, and tilt at the windmill or is the best step to administratively comply with something which should have minimum impact on us for a reasonable amount of time, at which time down the road we can undo some of this if we think that makes sense. Um, I want to pause for a little bit here. Um, it's almost nine o'clock. We still have to take public comment. I know it's going to be brief. I want to check with the chairs first uh, to see if there's any other comments, but I also want to move on to the administrative pieces of our tight deadlines to make sure that we stay on top of them. So um, first, do the chairs want to request anything else of the consultant, any other points we need to take into account before I move on to dates? I would say no from the select board side. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're good. I think we should be defined what we're looking for, um, you know, for next steps on that. So I think we're good. Any any other comments from the board in terms of what we want from the consultant? Just one quick thing, Emily, just to, if we are continuing at this point to parallel track the state hospital as a solution, if the state hospital was subdivided and the LDA wasn't a problem, taking the density that you have there, what would you um, what would you suggest as the district that would be left over? Because you would have, you wouldn't have, you'd need 25 contiguous. So you basically need to have A3, B. Yeah, so if you, if you, let's just say that everything worked out and you subdivided it out. So you were looking at the campus core district. So that's 29 acres. So oh, 29, I was thinking 22. Yeah. So you're over your contiguity. So you just need to cobble together 21 acres. You co cobble together 21 acres and then you're at 670 units. So you'd have to um, make up the number of units. Um, you could spread it out a little bit because you can have a lower density. So, you know, there's... I guess I'd, I'd look at if you could get it to work with the state hospital with 10A plus the park and and 12. 10A plus the park and 12. Yeah, I can look at that. What do you guys think, Jim and Seth? Doug? Yeah, I think it could, knowing what, what that would be with the state hospital. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially the difference in the density with that plan one, you know, getting the state hospital versus this backup plan, you know, what that would look like in A3. I'd be curious to see that number go down. Um, sure. I'd be happy to test some options around that. Excellent. So um, before we open for public comment, I did want to uh, reiterate what I said in my memo. The next steps from here is February, I am hoping to have at least two joint planning board select board meeting dates. I'm hoping to work with um, Brittany Franklin and circulate maybe a poll of availability for the board, make sure it doesn't conflict with any other um, important meetings going on. I know it's um, budget season, so. So two meetings from planning board select board that should give us some time to hash out the finer details. Then I have for March 18th at 7.30 p.m., I'm hoping to have an in-person meeting at the Public Safety Building. This will be our second MBTA zoning workshop. 
that is the last interactive workshop where the public will be actively seeking um, feedback and maybe have interactive exercises and really work um, with people just to, you know, we have the board's opinion plus the people, and then we come back with the bylaw that combines both. March 20th, two days later at 7.30 p.m., this is a Wednesday. That same Monday is actually um, town election, so we cannot hold meetings then. I know it's inconvenient, and I did want to check to make sure that the planning board, I know usually meet on Mondays, if we you would have availability that date, um, so that way we could have our first planning board hearing. The next date is 10 days after. We have April 1st at 7.30 p.m. That is a Monday. That is our second planning board hearing. So Emily will be able to join us for March 20th. That's one of the reasons we selected that date. So, you know, she'll be there for the workshop on Monday. She'll be there for the first public hearing on Wednesday. So we'll be able to, um, you know, together inform the public or ask for questions we have. So April 1st is the second hearing. April 15th is approximately the time where the warrant language is due. If we can have it done a week earlier, that would be great just because we're working with printer deadlines. So our town meeting is May 6th. The timeline that I provided over email doesn't have room for uh, much wiggle room. So we're trying to accommodate as much as we can. Um, Seth, I saw you had your hand up. Uh, March 20, would that be remote? I'm going to be on travel um, that week. It will be remote, yes. Okay. The only in-person meeting here will be the workshop. Everything else will be uh, 7.30 to accommodate schedules and remote to be even more flexible. Um, I know you have a copy of this deadlines. If there's anything conflicting or anything else I should know, please let me know. Uh, we're so early, we still can course correct a little bit. That being said, um, any questions on that? No? Okay. Good. Uh, would uh, Paul and Teresa still be recused um, on March 20? That depends on what districts we choose. I think- I, I would think they will be recused, recused the well, whole time. Most likely if things continue to go in this direction. So we'll be looking for a quorum at those um at the hearing, not not at the meetings. I'll get back to you about the 20th. Okay. Thank you. Did you say the 18th was in person? Yes. Okay. And um I assume you're gonna send us invites for all these. Yes. Um I'm hoping to post the agendas pretty far in advance so it's on the town calendar and I will send out calendar invites at the same time. Anything else? Okay. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A, and I think we have questions on the polls. I've never done a poll before, so hopefully I do this right. <laughs> I Googled it, so I'm optimistic. Jim, do you want to open that portion of the meeting? Yeah, we, I'll open a portion for the, uh, the meeting uh, regarding questions related to the MBTA zoning. All right. You want to read them off? You want me to read them off? You can read them. All right. So uh, I I can only see the um, the Q and A. So we can uh, start there. I can open the poll. So assuming it uh, from Christine Potts, assuming a town meeting passes MBTA zoning, what is the post vote process? How is the time used between May and December, for example? Just trying to get a better understanding of high level steps and process. Thanks. Um, do you want to, Emily, do you want to answer? I think you've been through this before. Yes, I have. I worked with uh, one of the rapid transit communities to do this. So you, the town then has to submit an application um, to the uh, to HLC. Uh, you provide the shape files of the zoning district. You provide the final model um, and you provide the zoning. Um, and they will uh, review all of those uh, all of those things. Um, there's also some documentation um, from the uh, town itself. So there'll be a letter probably from the select board 
uh, or from Christine uh, going in with that. Um, there's a certification of the vote required. So once all of those pieces are in place, um, they would, uh, the application, which is an online application, it's um, available to anybody to see, um, that gets sent to HLC and then HLC begins their review of the, uh, of the zoning itself. And then, um, I know for the pre-adoption review for communities that cho choose to do it, it's 90 days, I think, but I'm not positive. It's the same for the other. I'd have to look that up just to, to confirm, but they would get back to you with either questions um, or uh, um, come back and say whether or not you've met the compliance requirements. And this is why it's important that we start in May. If anything were to go wrong, we still have time to correct for a potential, but I know very costly um, town meeting in the fall. But I know that there's constraints to that, and it's really, really our backup. So we're we're aiming for May full speed. Um, Jim, do you want to read the next question? Sure. We're definitely going to rely on our consultant answer for this one. Can't we request an extension of Andrea Campbell since she delayed in getting important planning information to us? So Andrea Campbell, um, for those who don't know, is the Attorney General. Uh, she's the one who issued the letter that was being discussed earlier. Uh, she is, however, not in charge of um, uh, the whole compliance process. That's the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Um, so uh, they're the ones that um, uh, Christina and Maria mentioned, I mentioned earlier about answering questions. So it, it's not Andrea Campbell who's responsible for that side of the process. And judging from the um, the way the rapid transit communities, the tr 12 rapid transit communities, that whole process, um, my understanding is HLC is not granting extensions. I think, again, that's one of the reasons so many communities are going for a Springtown meeting is so that if, uh, you know, the Springtown meeting, um, uh, something goes wrong with the zoning there or something goes wrong with the application afterwards, there's still time to recover and meet compliance. Thank you. Um, Andrea, if you can provide um, us with your full name and address for the record, that would be great. I'm going to, I think I need to end the poll to see the results. Oh, this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Okay, never mind. Um, so the first question was from, from Chris Potts, which you already answered. And the second question is from um, a Sullivan says, why aren't we testing the Lowell's or Shaw's location considering the horrible traffic impact we are already having on Route 27 on either side of 109? You know, I think some of the thinking around that's been from the board has been, you know, these are larger parcels, right? So it's, it's, there's so much easier for somebody to convert to high density, you know, than assembling all these smaller parcels, um, you know, so the, the potential impact um could be greater and could be quicker than um you know i don't say the some of the low um low probability of some of these smaller parcels being, being assembled any any other comments from others yeah, I, was say, I think i've been a big advocate this whole time about locating things close to downtown because i feel like if this is located downtown, people can take advantage of not getting in their car and thereby reducing the amount of vehicular traffic through the town. Um, you know, obviously, if people are commuting into Boston, they're leaving from where they're going and, and heading out. But they if they lived within the areas that we were pointing to on the map, um, particularly in the pink in the downtown, as opposed to out in the business district next to the IE, people could walk to the grocery store, they could walk to restaurants and then avoid, you know, getting in their car. If you're located out at the Shaw's Plaza, you know, you're getting in your car to go everywhere other than whatever is exactly in your plaza. And if that was redeveloped for high density residential, it might not have much commercial in it. I'd say the last thing is I think we have so few commercial properties that I know, you know, we've been trying to balance keeping those opportunities available to keep the tax base strong. So on balance, it feels like other locations are better rather than the, that one, the levels and the Shaw's.
All right, is that the last one? Right. Yes, that's the last one I've seen come in. Right. Maybe we might have one more. I think one of the questions was um, whether we could get an extension from housing and livable communities rather than the attorney general. So that was just a nuance. Um, but I think from what I imagine, Emily, that housing and livable communities isn't looking to give extensions either. They they don't want to get in the mix of everybody asking for extensions. They just want to force everyone to comply. Again, just from seeing the rapid transit communities, there are no extensions there. So I can't imagine that it's going to be, I mean, never hurts to ask, I suppose, but I, I can't see it happening for the commuter rail and adjacent communities, which have this December as their um, uh, requirement. And then obviously the adjacent small towns is December 31st, 2025. So obviously no indication that there's going to be extensions for anyone. So, but you know, that again is up to the town if it wants to make that request. Um, the next question we have from the poll is from Chris McHugh. She says, just want to thank the planning board, Maria, and all our town officials for working through the MBTA community's challenges. We didn't ask for this, and so many people are rising to the challenge to try and make the best recommendations for the town possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's very sweet. And Chris has been amazing with her feedback. She's also helped me get the word out for meetings and dates, and I really, really appreciate um, just having her support on this. So thank you. Um, I think just one more thing came in. We have, I think, two more minutes for the um, public comment. There's one more question from Andrea. And again, Andrea, um, just want to make sure, could you provide your full name and address, please? And Jim, if you want to read the question. Sure. Uh, her uh, statement is, but we are uniquely over the compliance with the Medfield State Hospital. We should ask for an extension. And then, Emily, you can comment again. Uh, yeah, I'll just note that the MSH, M, uh, MSH sorry, um, uh, does uh, come up with the right amount or the over for the unit capacity and for the acres, but not for the density. So it doesn't actually currently comply. Um, we had then been talking about the campus core district, which was uh, more than met the density, but does not um, come up to the right number of units um, or acres. So again, does not comply uh, in and of itself. So um, uh, so yeah, again, up to the town, whether or not it wants to ask for an extension. That's good. Emily, just a quick follow-up to your, to the answer to that question. I believe though you are modeling the, 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 the what the subdivision would be. So we're at least going to look at what it doesn't give it the it doesn't comply for the full requirement, but it does in fact have the potential to comply for the 25 acres, leaving aside all of the technical nuances about it's not subdivided yet and we haven't sold it yet, but you are in fact modeling that I think. Uh, so we'll we'll at least know what that looks like. I will model it so we'll at least know what it looks like and then we can have that conversation again along with the other options that we talked about. So absolutely. That's that's definitely worth talking about because creating the subdivisions within our control, but I'm still very worried that the LVA is going to be a bar for this counting because I, from the state's perspective, I can see why they wouldn't want you to have a district that you zoned to be one thing and then entered contractually into an agreement to take those rights away. So I, I think we have other fish to fry with the state hospital. I just don't want to lose sight of the LVA. And I don't know that the town is in a position where we'd like to take away the limitation in the LDA just in case Trinity changes their plans. And I don't think they would, but you subject yourself to being taken advantage of in that regard. And I don't think that's the risk anybody wants to take at the state hospital. Um, so I don't want to forget that that's a significant hurdle as well. And um, we'll be following up on this at our next meeting. Um, I'm not, not sure on February 5th, um, because we have a different long hearing that night, but 
It'll be posted on the planning board agendas and the next public workshop exclusively for public comment will be on March 18th. If you want to join and continue the conversation, that would be fantastic. But there, this is not the end of this, it's uh, just the beginning. Um, I don't see anything else on in the chat or on in the polls. Should we close the portion of the public comment yeah. section? Make a motion to close the public portion of the comment session. So moved. Thank Sarah, you. For you. Seth. Did, yes. Did you second? And me. Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. Um, and I would like to thank um, Christine. I know you're incredibly busy. I really appreciate having you here. Uh, Gus, Pete, and Eileen too. I always like having you on meetings. You, have, you provide amazing feedback. And I am very grateful to have a select board who um, is so actively involved. So thank you for your time. And I really look forward to future meetings with you. No, thank you. Good meeting. <clears throat> thank Thanks you. for having us over. <laughs> bring, bring cookies next time, okay? Yeah. Hey, Don't do forget to close it for Thank select you. board. Do we have a motion to close the select board meeting? Yes, motion to close. Second. Eileen? Aye. Gus? Aye. Pete? Yes, too. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Take care. Thanks, everyone. All right. Let me um promote Teresa and Paul. And Emily, thank you so much for your assistance tonight. I will touch base with you tomorrow, but thank you. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, and thank you all for the input. Uh, hugely valuable, and look forward to working with you on the the next steps and looking at the results of the models. So, have a good night. Thank you very much, Emily. Emily. All right, what do we got left? Update from Seth. I'm to hear the historic update. No, I think oh. we got to we got to vote for uh, for Doug to to continue with us on our journey here as an associate. That's in it. Kind of a toss up. Yeah, you have to, to give him an interview. You vote me on I'll make a motion to appoint Doug as associate member for what, 2024? What's the term? Um, until I think June of 2024. <laughs> Definite. <laughs> oh, okay. I can move with that. You're a second name. that. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. So, Sarah, yes. Yes. Seth, and yes. Yes. Jim, yes. I think oh, the vote. Paul. Yeah, Paul and Teresa. Yes. Yep. Teresa. Yes. Thank Good you. you guys. Thank you. So, um, I think the vote is to recommend. I think the select board is the appointing authority. Just yeah. want to clarify that. So we'll have Doug on the next um meeting. And then once he um I think you get sworn in again, then we'll on a regularly schedule appointment. Um I think end of June or beginning of July is the annual reappointments by the select board. So then it'll be one year. We just kind of missed 2023 between the shuffle, but um, thank you for, for your interest. Um, and for volunteering for that IE district, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah happy to do it. It's fun. <clears throat> and I received a letter from James Sullivan earlier today. Um, submitting his resignation letter to the planning board. He says, please accept my letter of resignation from the town's planning board effective February 1st. Unfortunately, my personal and professional commitments have made it difficult for me to attend board meetings and dedicate the necessary time to the matters of the planning board. It has been a pleasure working with town staff and the members of the board. I have truly enjoyed the experience and the knowledge I have gained. I wish you and the board the best and look forward to working with you in the future. Please let me know if you need anything additional from me. Uh, that's great. If he's listening, thank you for your participation, Jamie, and the, on the board. We really appreciate the expertise that you brought. So um, I'll follow up with him tomorrow. Um, thank him. And 
will advertise for a vacancy, although I think Doc may have had someone who was interested, which is great. So I, I'll follow up with you, Doc, as well, and see um, how we proceed from here. That's good. Great. Um, I think that was the last from the agenda items. I'll hand it over to Jim again. I think Paul was really interested in South's historical commission and the update. So. I I, before I give an update, I'm curious. I haven't signed Paul's papers yet for the nomination, so I can come by. Thank you for bringing that up, Seth, because I will drop that off to the planning office tomorrow. If you guys are in the area, I'd appreciate signatures. Nice. That'd be happy awesome. To do it. Happy to help you if you need it circulated through some neighborhoods or something. Definitely. Going Thank nowhere. You. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Historical Commission, um, we. We met, I forget what we talked about. We talked about 13 South Street, which is the house directly south of the Brothers parking lot. Uh, that's in disrepair. That's on a demo delay. We've got some designs on that. We're gonna have a hearing. Right now it's scheduled for Valentine's Day, so that just won't work, but we'll, we're gonna discuss the designs again. We'll have it publicly posted. So welcome feedback on that. Um, and uh, we talked about the subdivision of Harding Street. So you can, rec you can expect a report from the commission uh, on that proposal. Um, so we'll get you that what? before the meeting. February 5th? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I think that's it. I, there must be other stuff. Teresa, you got anything? Um, yeah, from the school building committee, I think we, everybody's probably heard the news that we did not uh, get approved for MSBA in December. Um, so um, the next actions by the school building committee, I mean, we're still, um, we're actually going to put out um, an RF, QRFP for a um, school projection enrollment consultant. Um, we felt like that that's really, we kind of get to our basics again of understanding. We know that um, the last go around, there was a lot of concern over the in school enrollment projections that were coming back. There was two different ones. And so let's bring in a third and, and go back and, and validate to see what those are. Um, and then um, we're starting to look at the hard at the feasibility study again to say, okay, well, what are those elements that we could still reuse? What would still have to be redone? Because um, MSBA is not going to reimburse a feasibility study, you know, another one for, e even if we were accepted. So um, where are we at? What can we do? And then um, I, we do expect, um, I do think uh, Dr. Marsden will come and approach the SBC about at least starting the process and, uh, and applying again in 2024 here, but that doesn't mean that we won't also still can kind of pursue options of what if we would go go at it on our own and start looking hard at uh, what that would look like. So that's where we're at. Doug, you're still in the and. Um... Industrial extensive and the uh, economic development. Yes. Yeah, we have a meeting that we're working on scheduling. Uh, I filled out my doodle poll, Maria, um, to do a follow up and in anticipation of the next meeting in March uh, and review some of the feedback we got. I think, you know, and maybe structure the engagement in a way to get us a little more constructive feedback the next time. So I think we're going to try to schedule that next meeting uh, in, later in next month. Yeah, I think it's March 27th is going to be our next, our second and last virtual workshop. And we're trying to have a internal stakeholders meeting the month before to really figure out what needs to be asked of residents. We did end up, um, we had like 30 people show up at our first workshop and take that survey there. And then we had an additional 70 people submit surveys online, which is really great. So we ended up getting a hundred responses from the polls. So now we're just trying to get some clarity um, on what we're really trying to narrow down the goals. We have like 25 different things that people want to see. So we're trying to narrow it down to three. 
Some of them are actually mutually exclusive. Some of them complement each other. So trying to see what can be combined and come up with strong recommendations and maybe an action plan for where we go. But I, I would value the internal stakeholders input on how to get that information across and um, make sure that we're asking things in a clear and easy to answer manner, I guess, and providing the right information. Because I think the hardest things with information sessions is you don't know what the public knows. And sometimes there's a big gap and you know it's, it's, it gets very technical. So I wanna get better at engaging at that level. All right, that's great. Any other new or old business? Meeting minute vote. Oh, we had a, uh, do we have meeting minutes on here? Yeah, Kara emailed them around, right? Sorry. Jim, you forgot about me again. <laughs> I forgot about you again. I, I looked at the agenda, didn't see him on there. So <laughs> three sets. I gave one, uh, one change for September 18th, but otherwise they looked great to me. Yes, I received your response. Thank you very much, Seth. I can make a motion for September 16th and the November one is, I was in attendance for those two, uh, November 6th. I will second the motion on those and we can circle back on December. All right, Seth. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Paul. Yes. Risa. Yes. Me, yes. Doug. Mm hmm. And yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of December 18th, 2023. Second that for you. All right. Seth. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Paul. I was not in attendance. Not in attendance. Teresa. Yes. Me, yes. And Doug. Yes. All right. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Teresa. Yes. Me, yes, Tug. Yes. All right. Adjourned. Thanks, A lot of great prep, Jim. Thank you.